things academia. Uh, what, um, <laughs> I'm Chris. <laughs> with me tonight is Stephen. Are you sure? You're, you're having problems with yourself. I'm not sure if you know I'm here. You know what's throwing me off is Robert's not with us tonight. That's and true. So I'm used to seeing two faces looking <laughs> back at me on Skype as I'm giving up, uh, saying things. And then I just realized that, yes, Robert is not with us today. Uh, so we are just flying duo. Well, the, the key thing from this is Robert is doing something that may be a topic for another conversation. He's doing fundraising at the moment. That's a big part of academic jobs in, in at least a specific way. So uh, we'll be able to take this conversation, his missed uh, contribution to our talk today, and turn that into a, a new, t new uh, podcast in a couple weeks. Yeah, it could be next week's show, actually. So, <laughs> uh, well, uh, as you listen to our show, if you decide to like what you hear, please click like or subscribe. Uh, leave us some feedback, and uh, don't hesitate to email us or uh, tweet us at, profess uh, at prof life to, uh, yeah, it's going to be a long show. <laughs> You're having some problems here, man. Yeah, yeah, I'm having all kinds of problems. We're going to recommend us some show topics, you know, just want to chat with us, just tweet us, email us, whatever the case may be. Check us out Anytime that you want to give Chris feedback on the whole presenting thing. He says he's a good teacher. I mean, that's what they claims, but... Uh... I, I think I am, but the truth of the matter is podcasting is different than teaching. And uh, we record these late Sunday evening. Right, right. Which uh, I'm definitely not at the peak of my mental facilities on late, late Sunday evening. So that's my excuse and I'm sticking with it. Fair enough, fair enough. Whatever works for you, man. Yeah. All right, we should get to the show topic. That's All right. Enough. into being a professor or from postdoc into being a professor where you have to start standing on your own two feet, right? And uh, you have to develop your own research program. And, and at some point, professor, uh, promotion and tenure uh, committees are going to want to see you as an independent scholar. Right. right? And so uh, I thought we'd talk a little bit tonight about how to make that transition or how you made that transition, those kinds of things. Um, so I'll start. Spot, well, appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, I, <laughs> I did my research in um, nonlinear dynamics. I still do my research in nonlinear dynamics. But when I went to grad school, I knew I wanted to be at a teaching focused institution. And I knew that part of being successful at these kind of institutions is inter uh, involving your uh, undergraduate students in your research. So I wanted to choose a research topic that I could involve undergraduates in. And I sort of did. But then the research in graduate school evolved into this this field called Integrable Hamiltonian Systems, which the only thing you need to know about that is that math is really hard <laughs> and it's not appropriate for undergraduates at any level. All right. So um, when I got out of graduate school, I uh, went ahead and changed topics. Uh, my first teaching gig and went into time series analysis, which had much more accessible math for undergraduates. What was the implication for you? I mean, if you're establishing yourself and you spent grad school sort of defining an identity around this thing, did it have any sort of meaning that you have sort of a break point in your, your CV? Uh, well, I had to get restarted, you know. Um, so there was a bit of a transition time where I was finishing up old projects and old papers. and But while I was doing that, I was reading up on time series analysis, which I've always been interested in graduate school anyway. And a lot of our research group members in grad school were involved in it. Okay. So it wasn't like completely out of the clear blue sky that, you know, they could just jump. That said, uh, there was definitely a transition time. However, at the teaching focus institutions I've been at, um, it was not that big of a deal. Okay. Because the, the end payoff of having undergraduates involved in my research meant much more than a year or so without a publication. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, if, would that have worked in an R1? No, absolutely not, right? Because you're hired on some level of reputation and right. you establish that reputation that field that you've devoted to. It's less, um, it's less of a big deal places that I've been at. Okay. You know, you're not hired for your reputation in your particular subfield necessarily. You're hired on your ability to teach. And obviously as a scholar as well, but not not the level as, the, you know, all right, like where you are. <laughs> Right. Very right, right. Very different. Right. So, so, so how did... I ended up standing on two feet because I completely ditched the dissertation. <laughs> I wasn't worried about, you know, being 
judge, oh, well, all he did was just live off his dissertation for five or six years to get tenure. Right, right. Right, that this was not an issue. Well, it's a good. I mean, it's a good place to be able to say, you know, I am an independent person. I, as you said, going through the promotion and tenure process, uh, I'm the head of our college or our, our departmental patcom right now, and we're going through the same sort of thing. And it's, it is that conversation about, you know, what is the independence of this person, right? And so that was the question you had. You made a decision that was something that you're interested in, right? But it was uh, done with the focus of solving a secondary problem, which was involving grad students or undergrads, right? Um, that's an interesting question because I'm not sure that I, I would be able to make that transition that way. I don't know that I could make a decision saying I want to make sure I put my undergrads first. Um, though I do know, you know, having worked with a lot of people in psychology, that is a big part of what they do. They, they take their, uh, they build these, these research labs in a similar way and have, you know, 5, 10, 20 undergrads running through their labs at any given time. Definitely raises some interesting questions. Uh, so as you're going through this, you know, you said this is something that you saw early on. Uh, you saw in grad school, but it's not what you were, you know, sort of passionate about in grad school. Was it the reason why you were not passionate about in grad school is because your advisor was passionate about something else, or how'd that work for you? Um, I wouldn't say that I, I wasn't necessarily passionate about the integral Hamiltonian system stuff. I found it interesting, but I definitely did not intend to make a career out of it. Okay. Right? Uh, and the, the important thing for me was that uh, you doing this integral Hamiltonian stuff got me uh, a good foundation in nonlinear dynamics. Okay. Which allowed me sort of the portability, the ability to shift sort of into time series analysis and not have to com lean on a completely new literature, if you will. Right. Um, because there's a lot of shared language, a lot of shared sort of ideas. Um, so, but yeah, I, the interval of Hamiltonian systems, they were fun while I did it, but hmm. I definitely, I knew pretty early on this was not going to be the career for me. Um, but like I said, I enjoyed it. Um, I got some useful work out of it, and I definitely don't regret starting mm -hmm. my research career that way uh, by any measure. might have been a little better for me in the long run to I start time series analysis, right. and I almost did. We had a project pop up, and I was actually going to change my third year of graduate school into time series analysis, but then the project didn't get funded. <laughs> so I went back to the, the Hamiltonian systems and, and rode that out for graduate school. Right. Um, Again, I, I, I enjoyed it. I, I won't, you know, I, I had a good time. It was a lot of abstract math. I enjoyed abstract math. It, I, I really enjoyed it. I just knew that you can't do this with undergraduates. No. I'm sorry? I was say, I'm not even sure what abstract math is, but I'm assuming it's like one plus sort of two <laughs> equals something. Sometimes I felt like that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's one of those things where you know, I knew I couldn't do it with undergraduates, and I wanted, I had so many positive experiences doing research as an undergraduate. Hmm. Right. So, um, yeah, it, you know, I, another option I guess I could have taken was I could have done sort of uh, experimental physics or sort of tabletop experiment kinds of things, laser physics, those kinds of things. They tend to work well in um, undergraduate institutions as well. Um, but I'm a theorist at heart, so this is what made sense to me. Plus burning things. You like to burn things. Yeah, I do like to burn things. <laughs> um, I have a lab for that now, actually. It's kind of cool. Every child grows up wanting to have a job where they get to set things on fire and that's study true. the fire. That's true. <laughs> Every child ends up becoming a scientist. That's, well, that's fair. That's so, fair. How about we uh, talk about your, your story a little bit? Here? Well, so I, I'm in a sort of a weird space. Um, so I, my advisor was very well known, or still very well known, for his research on teamwork. Uh, and that that is my space. So in part, I chose to go to, to grad school to work with him and... Uh, in part, I chose, you know, him as an advisor when I'm actually in grad school, you know, those whole things I want to do teamwork stuff. But what's interesting is I think of anybody who actually has ever been his student, I am the most similar to him in terms of actual research topics. A lot of people worked with him because he was famous and successful and, and a great mentor, but not because they actually cared about his research topic. Whereas I actually went in there saying I'm actually interested in his research topic, which is kind of a harder transition. So I actually didn't fully withdraw from working with him until I was probably five years into my career as a faculty member. Um, so I actually continued on with a lot of stuff because we had so much an overlap and interest. And so we built up this whole sort of research package together. Um, but then, so there was that transition. I know the big part 
was as I approached tenure was, you know, what is different about me versus him. Uh, and, I, I mean, fortunately, I had an entire different research stream that was not teamwork. It was this work on uh, the creation of jobs and, and the design of work. Uh, that was a completely independent phenomenon over what he was doing. But it was that kind of thing. It was like, how do I separate what I do from him? And it wasn't until I was probably about four or five years into being a faculty member that our research really started to split into very different directions. Uh, he moved into these larger structural systems, and I moved down a level looking within teams. So he went up looking above teams, and I was looking within teams. Uh, and so we really don't have a huge overlap in our content area anymore. Uh, that being said, what you said about you know moving off your dissertation and not doing anything with it, uh, my dissertation died a horrible death, um, mostly because the direct, the key confidant, the person who I was getting my data from, had a heart attack in the process of me collecting the data, which limited my ability to get access to that organization, as you can imagine. Um, so it was one of those things of it was pretty clear I wasn't going to live off my dissertation because I didn't have enough of my dissertation to do a whole lot of anything. Uh, but, you know, it, you pose this as an interesting question. You know, that, that's how you, you set up this, this topic for today, Chris. You know, how do you separate yourself? Um, and it's a really hard thing to say. You know, if I wanted to work with this person because they do exactly what I want to do, how do I not be that person, right? Because we know that they're successful. We know what they can do. And that was, you know, a mark. I mean, that was definitely something that I had to show was different about me, that, you know, I wasn't just working with him you know, doing what he was doing. And so that's, I think, in, I, I started to make a strategic decision around about year four of, of being a faculty member of saying, I'm going a different direction. I need to choose something. Even though I like what I'm doing, I have to abandon this in many respects to, to sort of make a new mark. You know, and, and that's a hard thing, you know, to, to, to walk away from something that I was actually fairly excited about just for strategic purposes. Um, <laughs> or, you know, those kind of things. Right. See, so that was the weird thing. So when I was at my my first job, I, I came in with such a, a large CV that they actually told me when I walked in that I basically had to not, you know, punch somebody in the face and I was going to get tenure there. Um, and it was it was in a much more coarse language. We're still trying to keep the uh, you know the PG ratings on on this, but that's what was told by by basically my mentor at my my first job. So there was no there was no cost. There was it was basically a, a perception that I had of of the field was going to look at this way. So it wasn't it wasn't my department at all. Uh, and at four years is when I actually moved to my my new job. And so that was where I started to have that awareness of you know what you know going through my third year, going into the interviews, thinking. Okay, I mean, I'm starting at this point saying something different, and I need to be because I'm out in the market for the first time since I was a grad student, really, and I need to, to say something that isn't what I look like as a grad student. So I didn't get the formal feedback from the departments, but I got sort of an informal, hey, Stephen, you should be aware of these kinds of things as I was moving through uh, the, the early assistant professor stage in my career. Right. It's such a large field that, yeah. you know, this... Anyway, um, so I had to make it pretty clear, but even uh, when I was, I guess it was my first or second year, uh, my a dissertation advisor and I were putting in for a grant with other institutions as well um, to continue offshoots of that work. And, uh, you know, as I was pre helping prepare the grant application and whatnot, I had to, during my evaluations, point out very clearly this is different from my dissertation work. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's related, but it's not the same. And I even talked, to, I went to the dean, and I talked to the dean, and I said, you know, I'm looking at, you know, pursuing this possible project. Um, if there is some similarities, but this is completely different. It's how it's different. Is this going to be a problem? <laughs> and of yep. course, the dean's like, you know, grant money. <laughs> Mm -hmm. of, of the 
establishing the differences in my research between what I had done there and what I'd done in graduate school. Right. Um, but I think this is actually a really good point also, now that we're both on the other side. We're both full professors, you know, looking at others going up for promotion. And so as you start to see letters coming in from outside reviewers, particularly about research-related points, uh, that is something that's raised. You know, what's the independence? Are they a thought leader? That's a big term in our field. You know, is this person a thought leader? And a lot of that is, is a signal from which how much have they differentiated from others, right? How much are they their own person? Uh, their, to their topics not carried over from their advisor, not carried over from that really early work they might have done with some other faculty. Uh, and I think that's that's something that people do have to be aware of because letter writers really, at least in, in our field for sure, they really want to look at this and say, this person should be given lifetime employment because they will add something to your department. You know, they are not just going to be riding the coattails of somebody else. Right. So you have to have this thing over there. Right. Right? Uh, you can't rely on the collaboration with someone in your, your department, a colleague that's doing similar stuff or whatever. If you don't send your two feet, you won't have a research program. Right. And so, and, I, and you know, again, at the smaller schools like where I'm at, the research isn't that big of a contributor towards fruition and tenure, mm -hmm. typically, but it's still an element. Yeah. And Right. You know, uh, I, I usually the, the language is something along the lines of you know the promise of scholarship or a certain level of success in scholarship or promotion. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. you got to show that you're you know at least capable of doing these kinds of things. Right. Um, yeah, and I've seen people in my career, you know, looking back on it, who weren't able to make that distinction. Right. Like weren't able to break away, and, and in some cases they suffered for it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, some of that I wonder is, is that a mentorship question, you know, and there, there are people who you've seen who are just productive researchers and yet, you know, and they have, they publish with students, but the question is, are they teaching the students anything or is it just, you know, go and do this grunt work, you know, do this a calculation or do the, you know, data collection or do this other thing as opposed to understand theory understand data analysis, understand nonlinear dynamics or integral Ham Hamilton something. Close enough. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't think I'm going to make it as a physicist. That's impressive then. That's that's a really well done process. But it takes time. Yeah. And so, you know, if a student comes into my lab around their sophomore year, they can slowly work up and by the right. time they're a senior, they're contributing to projects. Right. Right. Um, but it's definitely not happening in a year or even two years. Right. And that's the problem in a lot of places. I mean, I think of you know, when I started getting involved in research as an undergrad, it was really end of junior year. Um, you know, that's when I started basically saying, oh, God, I have to do a thesis. Uh, but fortunately, you know, with a psych program, which is what I was, you're trained on research from basically day one in the program. We had research uh, design classes. We had statistics classes, et cetera. So we were able to walk into that, exposed to that world. So it wasn't completely uh, blind when I actually tried to start doing this. Though, you know, again, I imagine the same sort of thing with you is that you have to understand what it is to do research, particularly when people say, well, what is math? 
I, I learned math. It's like, well, that's that's not the same. <laughs> Doing research on this is a big difference. Okay. Know? And it took me a while to get good at it, but eventually I think I did. Um, I started doing research projects my freshman year. Yeah. Uh, absolutely amazing. My, soft, my second semester of my freshman year, um, the department at the time had started this new research program kind of thing with students. And uh, I signed up for it, got in, and my project was um, self-directed. I came up with my own. I wanted to calculate something called the Hubble constant, which basically measures the rate of expansion of the universe. Okay. And so I researched into how is this calculation done, and one of the limiting factors I had realized was that you actually have to have data to do this. <laughs> and so I spent my time reading these books and, and papers about how the calculation is done, and I realized, gee, I, I actually need data. And so my mentor was like, yeah, we need data. How about if you email this professor out in California? And to her credit, she emailed me back and snail mailed me papers. Wow. I got a packet, a <laughs> thick packet from her uh, weeks later, not, not that many weeks later, but came to me in the mail. What is this? And like, These are papers. And, I was, and they were her papers. And she was calculating the Hubble constant, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was going through this stuff, and I could use her data. Uh, and, and make some rough calculations. Now, this wasn't what I would call professional science on any level, and I was doing a lot of the results. I was using her results from her papers to make my own calculations, which, of course, I got similar answers that she got. Right. But the point is, is that I learned a lot of research methods mm -hmm. at a very early age, and then the culture of the school was to just keep that up, and so I worked on various other research topics throughout my next you know, three years there at school. In my senior year, I actually mentored a freshman who was interested in doing another Hubble constant calculation. And so the professors there said, hey, why don't you talk to Chris? He did this his freshman year. And you guys can work together. And it, it, I, I was very lucky. Yeah. Very lucky. I mean, again, I wouldn't call what I was doing high-end research by any measure. Uh, with the exception of one case where we were working on a NASA-related grant, that was fairly high-end research. Mm -hmm. But that exposure early on meant a lot to me. It, it's basically, you know, it's, it's throwing you in the deep end in terms of exposure and participation in research. Yes. You're going to do stuff. Even if, again, as you said, you're not publishing the Hubble Constant. You're not, you're not doing that. You're doing it to, to be self-directed version of experimentation. And that that's a different a different world than I think most undergrads would, would experience. So that's great. Yeah, I just, I, I, you know, I lucked into it. Fantastic. Is, is what it boiled down to. I lucked into it. And uh, so what I try to do now is try to provide those kinds of experiences to my students. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like I've benefited positively. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the key to doing that, though, of course, is becoming your own independent researcher. Right. Well, yeah. But see, it, it, it feeds the other direction, though, saying that you set up from day one being an independent researcher. Do what you want to do. And since you were encouraged to do what you want to do from day one as an undergrad, that made it a whole lot easier that once a new thing became interesting to you later on, you could pursue that without feeling, oh, I should just continue to work with this person or do this other thing. I think that helped. Mm -hmm. It was just that you need to be participating in research, right, right. and it's best if you have undergraduates involved. Yeah, that gives a lot more freedom than if right. you're under, like you know, you have to top tier, and you have only, and it can only publish in top tier, and yep. you have to bring in X number of dollars every year in grant. Yep. I mean, let's be quite frank. If I was in that game, then there's no way in the world I would have changed my research. Right. Which is, again, why I changed it where I did, is that I sort of established myself and was able to get myself locked into tenure and then start making a transition. And then as I got full, promoted to full, that's when I made a transition to sort of a different set of questions. Because that's where I'm in right now. You know, I got promoted to full a year or so ago. Um, and so that's where I said, okay, well, now I'm in that position which I can not just separate myself from 
you know, where I was or my advisor. That, that was years ago. I did that already. But now it's in the how can I do something that has a lasting mark in the field? You know, and it's funny because I've had these conversations as, as with other people, other faculty, and they're saying, well, you should be doing that as a first-year grad student. You should be independent. You should have break the field. You should have all this new... Th-. Like, that's nice. But, you know, I was looking to get tenure. I was, I was looking to get a job. Then I was looking to get tenure. Then I was looking to get full. And now I'm looking to do, you know... I had a plan, and I had a directed plan, and I'm not going to try to shoot for, you know, the moon on the f- first bottle rocket. Um, the mix, various thoughts. Yeah. Right. Uh, you can pursue what you want. It's a nice place to be uh, because there's just there's no pressure. Right. At this point, you know, and if you change topics and it takes you three years to get a paper out. Right. Okay. You know, it's uh, not hurting anything. Right. But you're right. You can't be that independent that early in your career because you have to chase down these goals. Right. So that you can get to a position where you can then be that independent. And depending upon where you are for, you know, data collection needs, you know, some things are a lot more difficult, obviously. My world, data collection is harder than some other social science because I need these collections of teams over time. So it's not the easiest thing, but I'm also don't need, you know, access to, you know, the very large array. You know, I don't need a grant to do what I do. I don't need a $10 million grant. I know people who, you know, have colleagues who, you know, picked their first job based on, whether or not what school would give them the most funding to set up a lab, you know, because the lab, you know, having the million funding to set up a lab was critical to actually develop their whole research career. That that that's a different world. If you're in that spot, I mean, you've got to pursue something based upon your ability to get the funding and your ability to get tenure. You know, those those things may say do whatever, <laughs> you know, be on your advisor's grant if that means that's how you got the grant to be able to do this. I mean, that that has a very specific connotation. Mm-hmm. Uh, what what are the sort of side effects of pursuing this field of research? Right. Right. And what kinds of jobs are you interested in? You know, like I said earlier, I was very much interested in undergraduate teaching focused institution. So that told me that, you know, there are certain fields I wasn't going to pursue mm-hmm. because it would be hard to get set up to do those kinds of things in that kind of institution. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, a little forethought pays off. Uh, yeah. But a lot of times it doesn't happen. Because we get so enamored with what we want to do, you know, I want to do this. I'm very excited about this, and then you get part of the way through it, or you know, all the way through it, and you realize, uh oh, you know, I can't maybe do this or that because I'm doing this now, and you know, maybe some certain doors are closed. Right. And absolutely, I, you know, I closed doors off pretty early. I was yep. making decisions that I made too. You know, um, so when you're thinking about your research as a graduate student. It's, it's more than just, you know, do I want to be doing this particular study for the rest of my life? Mm-hmm. It's also what jobs are available, what opportunities are open right. to me if I choose it. And you're always closing doors. You just want to make sure that you're closing the doors that you don't want to reopen. Right. Right. Um, it's every time you make a decision, you're closing some doors. Yep. And that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, you can't do everything. Right. Yeah. I, I, no, I was... Right. I was. I just want to add one last uh, sort of caveat in this whole thing. Um, you know, I've had I've had a handful of grad students that have gone on, faculty members, and so forth. And one thing that I've worked with them as well is making sure that they differentiate themselves from me, not because of my own ego kind of things, but in sense of the, you know saying, "Hey, I've already gone through this too." You know, pursue this. You know, this is interesting. I want to work with you, and I get that, and we can continue to work together in the future. But right now, we're going to take a sort of siesta. And you're going to pursue this other thing that you're excited about so as to establish yourself more. You know, and that was actually an important thing. Yeah. I think that's excellent. You know, the sciences, there's a bit of an outlet for that in a postdoc. Mm-hmm. Typically, you know. But I, and now, as with new undergraduates, I worry less about that. Because yeah. They're going to undergraduate school, they're going to, they're going to do their identity there, right? Yeah. And so, I, and not that I'm making carbon copies of me, you know, sending them out into the world. That's, that's not what I'm doing. But I don't have to worry about that differentiation. Yeah. Instead. Yeah. yeah, I think that's excellent mentoring on your part um, to make sure that those students get that differentiation mm-hmm. so that when they get out in the marketplace, when they get that tenure track job, right. you know, 
they see them as yeah, you're, you know, they're Stephen Humphrey student. Yeah. Great. Okay. Right. But you know they also have their own identity. They're going to be able to stand on their own two legs yeah. when they get out there and make it big on their own. Yeah. I had a joke with a uh, colleague at one point who I think I had my name on his CV more than his name. Um, that was a bad sign. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, that's what you don't want. Yes, sir. Come back to it at a later date, either uh, through poor planning or just <laughs> <on their own>. <laughs> <laughs> or you know, as as our listeners are posing things, hey, can you expand on this a little bit further? We're happy to do so. Yeah, please do. We'd love to hear from you. Um, again, you can tweet us at Prof Life. You can um, uh, email us, uh, Chris at JesterCat.com. Feel free to email me. I will make sure I share comments with all of us involved, and we will uh, even, if you would like, read email on the show. <laughs> That's, there's nothing more exciting than hearing us reading emails. Oh, absolutely. But we would love to hear from you. And, yes. Uh, please, like I said, click like, subscribe, all those things on YouTube and, and iTunes. And uh, until next time, let's just get back to writing.